Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is April 24th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope everyone is doing well out there. So we're going to stay away from the Three Ring Circus. We're going to stay away from the Brexits of the world. We're going to stay away from the Yellow Vests. We're going to stay away from all of these stupid issues because that's what they are. It's, it's unbelievable, but that's where we are. It's where we've been. It's where we are going to remain. But what we're going to do today, and of course, we will have to have conversation on those things because some of them are important for one reason or another. But I'm going to give you guys a break. I'm going to give myself a break. And we're going to have a deeper conversation today off of policy. So put your thinking caps on. We're going to get a little bit more cerebral on this one. Again, away from the clowns, the circus, all of that jazz, because we had a report that came out recently regarding Social Security and Medicare, excuse me. And this is something that we have been discussing here on the Capitol News, either on the political podcast or the economic podcast. I know there's a lot of you who only listen to one or the other. And again, that's fine. That's why I break them down into two sections. But you guys have to understand how much so many of these issues that we discuss here at the Capitol News overlay. It is political. It is economic. It's everything. It's hard to, you know, really break them apart in a lot of issues. And this is most clearly taking center stage right now. And it's something, unfortunately, we're going to get into this further today, that politicians just don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. So according to the report that came out just the other day, the cost of Social Security will exceed its income in 2020 for the first time since 1982. When's 2020? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's next year. That's next year. So much for kicking the can down the road. It's already here. The program's reserve fund is projected to be depleted in 16 years. All right, 16 years, so that's 2035, 2036, however you want to go by it. At which time, recipients will get smaller payments than they are scheduled to receive if Congress does not act. So you were promised a whole bunch of money, not a great deal of money, but a lot more than what you're likely to get. My generation, the millennial generation, We're probably not going to get a dime of it, and obviously generations after us definitely aren't going to get any of it, but they're going to be paying into it because this is a grand Ponzi scheme, and we're going to have a discussion on what that means too. Meanwhile, Medicare's hospital insurance fund is expected to be depleted in 2026. It's only six, seven years away, folks, the same date that was projected a year ago. All right, so at least there's some consistency there with this report. At that point in 2026, doctors, hospitals, and nursing homes would not receive, would not receive their full compensation from the program and patients could face more of the financial burden. I don't think that's could. I think that's a definite will. Not could, they will have to pay more of the financial burden. Now, this is going to throw a big hiccup into the marketplace. Are we going to have more doctors, more nurses, more hospitals, more nurse, more nursing homes. I mean, if they're not getting paid, what's going to happen? Is the incentive going to be there to get into that industry? You know, one of the other things, when you look at it from an investment standpoint, you say, well, if I'm to look at the demographics, and I'm going to say, well, we got an aging population. A lot of people are going to be retiring. They're going to be living longer. You know, a lot of people might be in a bigger home. They're getting older, obviously. Their health might be deteriorating somewhat. Maybe they don't want to take care of their house anymore. Maybe they're not able to. So nursing homes, maybe that, investing in nursing homes or real estate investment trusts that own that real estate, that might be a good investment. On the surface, it makes a lot of sense. I'm involved in some of those things. But you have to be careful. Again, if it was easy being an investor, everybody would do it. It's not easy to be an investor and make money all the time. Okay? So if there's not the money to, to pay for these facilities, what's going to happen? Are they going to go out of business? Are they not going to, are there not going to be investors and developers out there to say, you know, we're going to continue to develop and build nursing homes and hospitals because, look, the money's there from the government. We have no worries. But now, wait a minute, we have some major concerns, some major concerns. So there could be supply issues, which will only go to increase costs even further, which is what would be very interesting. So you got to pay attention to the full story. So it's just something I want you guys to be mindful of as we make our way through some of this. So, (laughs) it's unbelievable. Although, 
Now, here's the, the bright spot they want to claim in this report. Although the report presented a grim, long-term outlook, which it is, it was something of a bright spot that Social Security's reserves are not depleting more quickly. The program's disability fund is now not expected to run out until 2052, 20 years later than what was projected last year. So I'm a little skeptical of that number off the bat because you had such a huge jump year over year. It's not expected to run out until 2052, 20 years later than what was projected last year. So last year it was projected 2032. All right, what are they attributing a lot of this to? Well, they're saying, well, because the Affordable Care Act has been around, a lot of people are now no longer on disability and taking benefits from Social Security. They're actually able to go out into the marketplace and buy some sort of health insurance policy. Okay, that's all fine and great. But what have been our recent discussions regarding the ACA, better known as Obamacare? Well, it might very well get struck down and be called unconstitutional some point between now and quite possibly the 2020 presidential election. We know that health care is going to take center stage. It's already being called Medicare for all on the, from the lunatics on the Democrat side. Of course, the likes of Pocahontas, Senator Elizabeth Warren, thinks that she can just have her ultra-wealthy tax, and that'll pay for everything under the sun. So that'll pay for Medicare for all. According to her, Bernie Sanders has those his policies too. Kamala Harris, everybody wants Medicare for all. So I don't know how they're all going to outdo each other. It's, you know, well, mine's freer. It, it, it'll be more free if you vote for me. I, that, that's going to be the insanity we're going to be hearing. Again, we're not going to jump into that circus. we got a lot of time to dive into each candidate's respective policy platform, and we're going to do that here over the course of the next year and a half. So stay tuned for all of that stuff. But this is going to take center stage. Again, President Trump was even out only a few weeks ago saying he wants the Republican Party to be the, re the party of health care. We say no. No, Mr. President. Not at all. The free market, that is supposed to be the place where this, this it is a problem. This problem gets resolved. Not with more government, not with Republican Party, not with the Democrat Party, not with the independents, not with the Libertarian Party, no political party. This is for the people to solve through entrepreneurs, innovativeness, all of that great stuff that make that makes this economy what it is. Now, of course, we have a lot of issues with our economy, but that's because we have the Republicans and the Democrats tinkering at every single level. You have to get out of it. So I don't want the Democrats being the party of health care. I don't want the Republicans being the party of health care. I want entrepreneurs to come into the market. I want the government to reduce regulations, eliminate regulations, and open up the marketplace to allow entrepreneurs to come in and do their things, and we will all be better off as a result. Take that to the bank. So we will see what happens with Obamacare because if that gets undone, well, then we might go right back to 2032, where even Social Security's disability fund will be depleted, and that's only a little more than a decade away. So that ain't good either, folks. Now, you have some Republicans out there trying to take credit for this report because some things are better than what was anticipated. I mean, how stupid can you be? You continuously kick the can down the road. You have a slight bright spot, again, which can completely be reversed if Obamacare is deemed to be unconstitutional, and I honestly believe that it is going to be struck down as unconstitutional, like it should have been already going on, uh, what, 2012, so seven years already. It should have been struck down when it was before the Supreme Court. I think most definitely it's going to be next time it makes its way to the Supreme Court, just because of the way that the mandate has been eliminated, and that was really the teeth in the whole thing to get people to buy it. If you don't buy a health insurance policy, well, you're going to be taxed. Well, now that that's gone, there's no teeth. So mm, they might strike the whole thing down, or at least parts of it. Now, next year, the combined cost of the programs is projected to be 8.7% of the GDP. 8.7%. By 2035, that will jump to 11.6%. Again, this is all highly predictable, given the growth of uh, our aging population, the demographics of the United States. This is, this is true across the globe, folks, especially when it comes to developed nations. So when you're talking about Japan, when you're talking about China, when you're talking about the UK, Germany, Italy, Greece, when you're talking about a lot of Western cultures, this is a big problem. Now, 
here in the U.S. It's not as big as it is in places like Germany or, or even Russia and Japan because we have more immigration, but that is not a panacea. That is not going to solve all of these problems. Now, one of the interesting things that we're likely to hear going forward, obviously the Democrats don't want to touch this because they think everything's fine or, there's, or their presidential candidates are just going to say everything's going to be free, and therefore if it's free, it's not going to cost anything, right? So they say it's, it's solved. You don't got to worry about it. Now, if you believe that, you better go get your head examined. But a lot of people are going to be voting for this insanity, so buckle up. What's likely to be the argument? Well, it's going to be just measures that kick the can further down the road. It's going to say, well, we'll just increase the retirement age. There's not going to be any early retirement. You're going to retire at 70. That's it. Now, that's according to the government. That doesn't mean that your employer won't let you go and say, okay, you know what, you're 69, 70 years old. But sometime before that, it's time to go. You no longer have the technical skills that are needed to perform this job. Maybe there's robots or artificial intelligence that starts to take over. And believe me, that's going to grow exponentially. And we're going to have a lot of interesting discussions regarding artificial intelligence because that is going to be a game changer. At least I think it's going to be a game changer. I think it's already in the process of being a game changer. So stay tuned for those conversations. It's, it's very, very, very fascinating. And I'm no expert on it, but what I've when I listen to some experts talk, I mean, it's just unbelievable what's likely coming down the pike in a very near future. And that's going to have huge economic consequences, just like this is, just like these programs running themselves into the ground. Why? Because they're managed by the government. So why do you want the government to be the party of health care? They can't do it. They can't manage Medicare and Medicaid. They can't manage your retirement program and Social Security. It's a big Ponzi scheme. But just give us a little bit more. So what are they likely to come out and do if they do anything? Well, we're going to increase the retirement age. We might increase the cap on your wages. So maybe $150,000, $200,000 of your income will be taxed at the payroll rate. Maybe they'll increase the payroll tax rate. That ain't going to be good for business. It's not going to be good for anybody. I mean, that's all they're really going to do. They're not going to say that you have to take a haircut. They're not going to say that, you know what, everybody's got to get together as, as a country. Maybe a lot of the senior citizens out there, you know what, you're going to have to move in with your kids. You're going to have to huddle all together because, I mean, what's the other solution? Borrow more money? You want to just keep borrowing more money? You just want to keep printing more money? I mean, if that was the solution, then Zimbabwe would be the wealthiest country in the world because all they do is print money. Do you ever hear about them? No, you don't because that doesn't work. It's not a solution. And if you do that, it will have huge negative consequences. We are witnessing. We are in the midst of excessive amounts of debt. We are in the midst of excessive amount of currency creation, money printing, funny money, counterfeit. It's what we're living in. Does everything seem great to you? No. This is why. These are the direct correlations. People are not taught this in school. That's why everybody scratches their head or is like, oh, this is over my head. I don't know what's going on. Who manages the education system? Oh, that's right. The government does. You think they're going to train you and have you think clearly and independently on this stuff? No, because as soon as you start to pull the curtain aside, it's a charade. It's a fake Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. That's how easy it is to tear these people down. We do it here every single day. They are living on the razor's edge, the powers that be. Because all it takes is a little bit of free thinking, a little bit of intelligence, a little bit of looking just slightly beneath the surface. And you say this is all a scam because it is. They're taking all of this money from you. They're promising you all of this great stuff when you retire. And now we're learning, which is no surprise, that it ain't going to be there. Now, we talked about this in our book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing. Again, we published this book back in 2015 already, but my goodness, is this ringing true? And before I get to this, just again, I know if you've been following this podcast, I talk about the U.S. Debt Clock quite a bit, and I advise all of you to go to usdebtclock.org and check it out. Your head's going to spin. There's a lot, it's a great snapshot of a lot of interesting data points. And when you look at Medicare, Medicaid, we are spending annually at this point $1.1 trillion. Social Security is just slightly above $1 trillion. And again, this isn't since the 1930s. This isn't since the 1960s. 
This is every single year, and these numbers are going to increase. They are going to eat more and more of the budget. They are going to take up more and more as a percentage of our GDP, as we just stated. So take a look at that, usdebtclock.org. I mean, I could look at this thing all day sometimes, and sometimes I, I spend quite a bit of time looking at it and really analyzing it because it's such a shame. It really is. I mean, sit there, write the number down, look at your U.S. national debt, look at that number when you start, write it down, spend a half an hour just looking at everything and thinking about it, and then look at how much debt was accumulated in that half hour, and then do the math and figure out what the change was in a short 30 minutes. It'll make your head spin. I mean, this is all the American people have to look at. I would hope, I would think, that might shake them a little bit and say, oh, we got a problem. We got a big problem. So getting to the cynics guide to investing in what we talked about, again, this was published in 2015. So some of the data when we had full year data, we looked at 1966 to 2013. So this is already six years old on some of this stuff. All right. At that time, if you simply added Social Security with Medicare, you're talking combined now. Let's see here. A little over $1.4 trillion. $1.4 trillion, six years ago, both of them combined. Now, individually, they're at a trillion dollars. Six years later, what do you think is going to happen six years from now when we have even more people hitting the retirement age? Makes your head think, doesn't it? Now, I'm going to read some of this to you. Beginning with Social Security, we observe another unsustainable trend. If you do not believe us, we will show you in a moment what the Social Security Administration, the SSA, has to say about long-term fiscal solvency. Yet before we mention those statistics, allow us to keep our analysis uniform and briefly discuss historic growth rates of these programs. All right, now here's where it gets interesting. With respect to Social Security, we observe an increase in spending from $20 billion in 1966 to slightly over $800 billion in 2013. So $20 billion to over $800 billion in a span of just a little bit over, just about 50 years. This represents an increase of 3,900% or a growth rate on a per annum basis of nearly 8.2%. 8.2% per annum. That would be a great investment record to make 8.2% like clockwork, wouldn't it? And again, folks, we're told inflation is only, you know, 1%, 1.5%, 1.82%, 1 maybe 2.2% on a bad day. No, not at all. If the government's spending this on its biggest outlays, you can bet your bottom dollar that inflation is nowhere near 1.8%, 2%, all right? For the last 20 years and 10 years, we witnessed per annum growth rates of 5% and 5.5% respectively. So even that, you could say, all right, well, maybe you're, over, you're, you're fudging the numbers there, uh, Mr. Caritas there, Mr. Capital News. No, we don't fudge anything. These are the government's numbers. So if anybody's fudging the numbers, it's the government. All right. While it may be a positive to see a slowing in the growth rate, we must keep things in context as outlays for Social Security are nearing the $1 trillion mark and an aging population will continue to place strains on the system. We've seen it coming, folks. It ain't rocket science. You just have to do a little bit of digging. You just have to do a little bit of thinking. With respect to Medicare, outlays have increased from $2 billion in 1966 to nearly $600 billion in 2013. This represents an increase of 29,900% or a growth rate on a per annum basis of nearly 13%. So you thought Social Security was bad, 3,900%, 8.2% on a per annum basis, holds no candle to Medicare, 29,900%, or a 13% per annum basis growth rate. 13%. But don't worry, there's no inflation. It's only 1.2%, 1.82%. Nothing to worry about, folks. Go back to sleep. Up your Prozac and Zoloft. Nothing to worry about here. For the last 20 and 10 year time periods, we witnessed per annum growth rates of 7 and 7.6% respectively. Consistent with Social Security, this trend is unsustainable. And this is due to the aging population coupled with overall health concerns, which we discuss in part two of the book. And you better believe we go in depth in that. Now, that quick statistics are out of the way. Allow us to highlight some other key figures as they relate to these programs. And then there's some other things that we get into. 
Now, interestingly, for those of you who may not be aware, and again, this goes back to 2013, according to the Social Security Administration, again, the SSA, with respect to elderly beneficiaries, nearly one in four married couples, that's about 25%, and almost 46% of unmarried persons depend on Social Security for 90% of their income. Can you believe this? 90% of their income. Where's the retirement savings? They don't exist, folks. This is why it all comes together. It all makes sense when we say all the time here, 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Paycheck to paycheck. Half of Americans couldn't come up with $400 in the cash in the event of an emergency. This is why so many people are dependent on the government. This is why so many people here. This is six years ago. One in four married couples and almost 46% of unmarried persons depend on Social Security for 90% of their income. In addition to this, we are also seeing another negative trend regarding the worker-to-beneficiary ratio. And this is, this is really a kick in the rear end to Social Security because it's a Ponzi scheme, and we're going to have that discussion here in a couple minutes. All right. Currently, there are nearly three workers for each beneficiary, but... By 2033, the SSA is projecting this ratio to hit two workers per beneficiary. Given these trends and the continual demand for Social Security benefits, where will the money come from to fulfill these promises? Good question. And apparently, the SSA does not know either. And again, you could do the same thing with social, I'm sorry, with uh, Medicare and Medicaid. It's in there, the cynic's guide to investing. Take a look at it. But in regards to Social Security being a Ponzi scheme, for those of you who may not be aware as to what a Ponzi scheme actually is, just go back to the middle of the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, and you're going to remember, I'm sure, Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff was a quote unquote investment genius. At least that was according to all of his investors, right? He was just making them money hand over fist, hand over fist. The problem was old Bernie was running a Ponzi scheme, okay? Had the Great Recession not occurred, it is my position that Bernie Madoff would still be in business. He would still be touted by all of his investors as a great guy, making them money hand over fist year after year after year. However, when you're in the midst of such a financial crisis, a lot of those investors need money. They need cash, okay? Maybe they have a whole bunch of their money tied up in real estate, and it's not really easy to sell real estate, especially when you're in the midst of a financial crisis that was pretty much kickstarted by the real estate market, all right? Real estate is not a very liquid market. However, it's relatively easier to sell stocks and bonds back into the market, get your cash, take your money out, and then you can live or do what you have to do, right? And so that was the problem that old Bernie faced, his investors wanted their money. The problem is, of course, being a Ponzi scheme, Bernie Madoff didn't have it. How does a Ponzi scheme work? Well, say I'm investor number one, all right, and I give Bernie Madoff a million dollars. And I say, well, all right, Bernie, here's, here's, here's a million dollars. See what you can do, all right? Bernie Madoff may actually do some work, may actually get a return on that money, or he may not. He might just work his butt off to go get more clients, all right? And if he actually does perform, well, for me, I'm going to be more inclined to tell f friends and family, hey, look, my guy's pretty good. He just earned me 15%. You know, take a look, go talk to him. You know, I can give you his number and hopefully he can do the same thing for you. But I'm going to stick with him because, hey, he just made me 15%. All right. Now, you go and you meet Bernie and you like him. Okay. And so you give Bernie a million dollars to invest. Now, say for some reason, I want some of my money. Okay. Not the whole thing, but some of it. Bernie isn't going to reach into my account and give me my money. He's going to reach into your million dollars and give whatever I'm asking from your money. That's how a Ponzi scheme works. Maybe I wanted $200,000. He's not going to go into my account and give me $200,000. He's going to take it from you. That is how a Ponzi scheme works. That is how Social Security works. You do not have an account with your name. All right. You have a social security number, but you don't have an account. This isn't like having an E-Trade account or a Vanguard account or a Charles Schwab account or anything like that, where it's your name, your money, you manage it. You can get online and see how much money you have in there. And that's it. OK, you make the decision. Mm -mm. That's not how social security works. All right. The government takes your money out of your paycheck. 
your employer pays his share of it. It goes into the general fund. That's it. You have a social security number. That's it. You don't have an account where it simply sits in there and it accrues interest like hopefully it would in the stock market or in the bond market or whatever you're doing with Vanguard or Fidelity or E-Trade or any other ones we just named, okay? It's not how it works. That's why we just said you have three to one workers, okay? That's the ratio of workers to, uh, to, to retirees, and it's getting worse. That's a huge problem, a huge problem because you're running out of other people's money, right? Who was that? Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of the UK. The problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. Well, that's where we are, folks. That's what's taking place right now. So that is a Ponzi scheme. Social security, by definition, is a Ponzi scheme because it's using current workers' wages to pay for current retirees. That's how it works. So any of you out there who are retired, when you get a social security check, that's coming from me. That's coming from people who are currently in the workforce working, contributing. Okay, just like when you were working, you were paying for people who were retired then. That's how it works. That's why this thing is in trouble. And this is why the politicians don't want to be upfront. They don't want to be honest with you. They don't want to tell you that it's a Ponzi scheme or give you any inclination that that's how it operates. Now, the funny thing is, I'm not going to get into this deep today, but we talk about this again in the, in the Cynic's Guide to Investing because this is a very interesting question to ask. When you have the discussion as to what to do with Social Security, you will have some politicians, particularly those that happen to be in the Republican Party, say, well, let's do it like that. Let's not have the government manage it. Let's actually have an account where you, the individual, can make the decision as to where you want to put this money. If you want to buy stocks, you can buy stocks. You want to buy bonds, blah, 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 right? Now, of course, the Democrats cry foul. They scream bloody murder, and they say, oh, no, you can't put the money in the stock market. It's too risky. They don't know what they're doing, blah, 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 like the Democrats and the government know what they're doing. It's going insolvent. So obviously it's not a good bet to be betting on the government in this regards. Now, is it? Now, of course, that would require a couple brain cells and two seconds of thinking, but most people don't have the time for that. So they just think it's going to be fine and they're just going to continue to trust the Democrats and the government to do this. So they raise bloody hell and they scream from the rooftops. Can't get done, can't do it because it's too risky to put it into the stock market. A simple question would be, well, who's to say that that's the law? Do you have to force people to invest in the stock market? No, there's a whole host of other areas where people can place their money that can gather interest. What about U.S. Treasuries? Hmm. If you're ever having a discussion with somebody who thinks that that is absurd, that individuals actually have the ability to take ownership of their retirement, I mean, before you smack them, just simply ask a simple question. Well, okay, well, all right, let's just say for the sake of argument that I agree with you that the stock market is too risky. What about Uncle Sam? Why can't people buy U.S. Treasury bonds? Why can't they just do that and at least they know what's going on? Why couldn't they take a, a ladder strategy approach to it, a bond laddering strategy, which simply means if you look at the rungs of the ladder as the three-month would be the first rung, the bottom rung, the six-month, one year, two year, blah, 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 and you go up the rungs, right? Well, as soon as the three-month bill expires, that is now the top rung, and you just keep going up and up the ladder as your bonds expire. That is a great way to invest. It's conservative, and what would the Democrats say to that simple question? Um, mm, that's Uncle Sam. It's the government. Uh, not a safe bet because you love the government. You love to manage it. Are you saying we shouldn't trust you with the finances? Are you going to default? I mean, it's so easy to trap these people, it's disgusting. But that's the world in which we live. Now, the other interesting question is, and we did this in the Cynics Guide to Investing, in, in, to investing and I'm not going to get into it deeply here, but before I sign off, we asked the question, what happens if that was the case? If instead of the government taking all of your money, you had it, and you did put it into the stock market, just simply the S&P 500, you just continuously put that money in, what would happen over the course of working for 40 years of your life? Well, no surprise. You end up with about two hundred and fifty to $300,000 on day one when you retire. In your pocket, your money, and that's just from Social Security. That's not counting what you pay in income tax. That's not counting what you pay in state and local tax. That's not counting what you pay in any other tax out there, Medicare, anything else. All right? Conversely, what does Social Security give you? over the course 
of your retirement, which you hope to be, you know, 20, 30 years, is that same amount of money. But it takes you 20 to 30 years to exhaust it. Here, if you invested it in the S&P 500 for 40 years, on the day that you retired, you would have two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars in your pocket, which of course you could then go back and reinvest and make even more money on it. But you want to trust the government. God help us all. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you as always. Please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, leave your comments. We would love to hear from you. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Kreitas. Godspeed. <laughs>